Hello, I'm Seema and welcome to part 11 of the chapter Periodic Classification of Elements. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the D block elements. In the previous videos, that is video 9 and 10, we discussed the S block and the P block elements. So let us now see what are the D block elements. I told you that the S and P block elements together are known as the representative elements and that is because in these two uh, in these two categories it is the outermost shell which is being filled up but the transition metals or the D block elements and the F block elements in these it is not the outermost shell that is being filled up rather in D block it is the penultimate shell that is one before the outermost shell and in the F block, it is two before the outermost shell, which is being filled up. That is, here it's the penultimate shell which fills up. And in F block elements, it is the inner penultimate shell that fills up. And the outermost shell is known as the ultimate shell. So let us see what are these transition elements. The D block elements, the D block starts from the third group to the twelfth group. They are written here in the periodic table where I have written them in blue and they form these four uh, periods here. They are present in four periods. That They are not present in the first three periods. They start from the fourth period which means and the reason for that is that the d orbitals are present in the third shell. Since they are present in the third shell and we know after filling up of the s orbital of the fourth shell the shell before it would be the third shell therefore the first transition series consists of elements in which the 3d orbitals are being filled up the next one that is in the fifth period the transition series has elements in which the 4d orbitals are being filled up that is it is not the fifth orbital uh, fifth shell but the fourth shell d orbitals of the fourth shell which is the penultimate shell so Based on this, the general configuration of the transition metals is written as they have n minus 1 d, the d orbitals of one shell less than the outermost shell is being filled up and electrons, they range from 1 to 10 and ns orbitals have, uh, have electrons, the ns will have electrons from 0 to 2. And uh, when I did electronic configurations with you, I explained what are the conditions when you have half filled uh, and completely filled orbitals which are more stable and in order to acquire that kind of a stability of half filled or completely filled D orbitals, the electrons of the S orbital of the next shell sometimes jump up to a higher energy that is uh, 3D orbitals and uh, they balance out. They make the overall configuration more symmetrical and more uh, stable. But these elements, they are called transition metals. Why are they called transition metals? Because their properties lie somewhere between the extreme properties of the S block and the P block elements. The entire periodic table is made on the basis of an increasing atomic number. Every element is one atomic number more than its preceding uh, one. Therefore, the electronic configuration is also gradually changing. There's a gradation in the uh, in the electronic configuration which results in the gradation in their properties. So we find that these elements, they, their properties lie between these strong metals and these non-metals and they, since they lie somewhere between the strength of the metallic character goes on decreasing and hence all other properties associated with these elements, they seem to show a gradation in properties. That is, they fall between these two extremes and hence they say they are called transition. The metals are transitioning into metalloids and then into non-metals. So they are known, all of them are metals and that is why they are called transition metals. They form one property of them which is very important is that they form colored ions. And that's the beauty of these elements, you know, most of the color that you see in the laboratory uh, and most of the color that you see around you in nature is because of the presence of these metals in those substances. So you'd see 
these colored ions and not only is uh, each one has its own color but each one forms different oxidation states um, that is they have different valencies and under different oxidation states they produce different colors for example if you have a ferrous ion which is a fe2 positive ion a compound having a ferrous ion would be greenish in color and Fe3 positive ion, that is again an ion of iron, which is a three positive charge, is known as the ferric ion. A compound of which contains ferric ion would be brown in color. So manganese would be pink, it would be fleshy pink, or it would be a darker pink. So nickel would again be green, copper compounds would be blue in color. So a lot of beautiful colors you see are because of the transition metals and they form uh, colored ions and they exhibit variable valencies the same element valency i told you is the combining capacity of an element how many electrons does it lose gain or share in order to acquire stability these transition metals they are found to show different valencies and they they show if you can acquire this much stability fine if not the stability is also good so they try to combine in as many ways as they can since they have those options and they produce more than one valency. They combine in different ways with different number of electrons that are involved and that is why they exhibit variable valencies or apparent valencies which are known as oxidation states. These elements, they are paramagnetic in nature. Magnetism is of three types mainly you could say if they are substances are either diamagnetic or they are paramagnetic or they are ferromagnetic diamagnetic substances are those which are slightly repelled by a magnet paramagnetic substances are those which are attracted by the magnet in the presence of a magnet they are attracted by it but as soon as you remove the magnet they just return to being non-magnetic in nature so they are temporary magnets you could say they act as uh, magnetic substances in the presence of a magnet but if you remove the magnet they uh, they lose that magnetism and ferromagnetic substances like iron cobalt nickel these are the ones that are uh, that are permanently magnetic that is ferromagnetic are strongly magnetic substances once you uh, it gets attracted to a magnet even if you remove the magnet they still retain that magnetic uh, property We'll study about this in details later when we study magnetism. But uh, these elements are predominantly paramagnetic in nature. That is, they get attracted to a magnet. They are mildly magnetic. They get attracted to a magnet in the uh, presence of a magnetic field. But once the magnetic field is removed, they return to being themselves. Non-magnetic rather. They are often used as catalysts. What is a catalyst? Imagine you're crossing a road and uh, you don't know who's on the road, you're just traveling alone and all of a sudden you find there's an old man and he's struggling to cross the road. He's finding it difficult. So what would your natural reaction be? You know it's easy for you to cross the road, you're young, so you'll just help that old man, you'll hold him, you'll help him cross the road and once he crosses the road, he's safe, you're happy you've done your work, you leave him, you go your way and the old man goes his way. Catalysts are such facilitators. They are substances which in a chemical reaction notice the chemical reaction like old men who are trying to react but they are unable to do it. So they just come, they give a hand, they help a little and bring the, carry the reaction forward to forming the product. And once the product is formed, they just move away and they, their work is done. They go their way and do something else. So these metals, they are often used as catalysts. And one reason for that could be that they show variable oxidation states. They have so many ways of doing, having so many, they can combine in different ways. And therefore, that makes it easy for them to hop into any reaction. Okay, I can help this one also. I can do this also. I can, oh, I can do that oxidation state and help that reaction. So these metals, they are often used as catalysts. Now, out of all the transition metals, you have zinc, cadmium, and mercury. You see here, these 
elements, these four actually, they have the general electronic configuration N minus 1, D10, N, S2. In these, the S and the D orbitals both are completely filled. Although the outermost shell is not complete, but the NS and the ND orbitals are completely filled. Therefore, their reactions or uh, their properties are slightly different from the rest of them where they still have to finish or rather complete even the D orbital or the S orbital which may have jumped in order to give it stability. So these three elements, they or rather four elements, they differ slightly from the other uh, transition metals. And I of course told you this, that the transition metals are called transition metals because they are a bridge between the strong metals and non-metals in the P block. The strong metals in the S block and the strong non-metals in the P block elements. So this was about the transition metals and the D block of the periodic table. In the next video, I'll do the F block uh, of the periodic table. Thank you for watching. Please like the video if it helped you. Subscribe to my channel and recommend it to your friends. And keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Bye-bye.